Hello friends, this is another episode in my series on the serotonergic system. In this episode, I want to talk to you guys briefly, although this subject could really be a long one hour and a half video because of the amount of uh, attention being spent on it in academic literature, and that has been in the last 70 years or so, maybe 65 years. But this, this episode is about how serotonin, serotonergic activity, affects depression. Now, the reason why this matters to people that are not depressed is this. It is well known, and studies have shown this, that uh, people who display more positive emotion in early life live usually, on average, a decade longer than people who display more negative emotion in early life. So it's not just about clinical major depressive disorder, but rather happiness in general. And this is coming from somebody that, I, I, although happiness, I know it's very trendy to talk about, or it was trendy a couple of years ago, I was studying happiness for over a decade. And I actually studied happiness with one of the leading researchers in the world, and uh, my advisor's advisor was the Nobel laureate, uh, Daniel Kahneman. And so, I, although I'm not going to talk too much about the, the details of happiness, I just want you guys to know that I firmly believe that even people without depressive disorder raising their serotonergic activity slightly, especially in those that have naturally reduced serotonergic function, which probably you won't know, and maybe, maybe by the end of the series you'll be able to get an idea. But um, I do, for example, and a slight, even though I was never depressed, really, uh, you know, even when I was, you know, my worst moments in life, I could never be classified as having a major depressive disorder, but slight increase in serotonergic activity for me and many others uh, enhances their positive affect in life. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the literature behind this in this video. I've taken some notes down so I don't forget anything. And even if you're not depressed and have never faced depression, I think that you'll find that this is uh, stimulating information for, for thought. So first of all, I want to say that uh, serotonin and depression were first linked in the 1960s. After the initial postulation of a relationship between the two, there is a class of antidepressants called tricyclic antidepressants. These were a class of antidepressants that had action at the serotonin transporter CERT, but also had action on the norepinephrine transporter NET. So these drugs increased the adrenergic signaling and the serotonergic signaling between neurons by inhibiting NET and CERT. But they're also really messy drugs. They, their pharmacology is very messy and they did a lot of other things. But because of their, uh, their known effect on serotonergic activity, the initial results with tricyclic antidepressants supported this idea that serotonin and depression were linked. Later it was shown that, number one, uh, I mean, Actually, I should probably mention this already. Uh, well, anyway, it was later. Sorry about that. My notes are always messy because I'm, I'm, I've been recording this all in one sitting, so I just write the notes right before the video. So anyway, and it's very messy. So anyway, what I wanted to say is that uh, number one, tryptophan depletion. Remember, tryptophan is the precursor of serotonin in the body. You have to eat tryptophan to produce serotonin. So, tryptophan depletion studies were shown to revert recovering depressed people into depression, but not to cause depression in people who were never depressed, which is quite interesting. What it implies is that serotonergic activity is necessary for the repair mechanisms that people go through to get out of depression. But a lack of serotonergic activity or reduced serotonergic activity is not enough to cause depression. Now, how may that happen, by the way? Let's hypothesize about it. Well, serotonergic activity, as you'll see in a later episode, which I haven't filmed yet, affects neurogenesis and uh, growth factors in the brain. So, reducing serotonergic activity, so imagine these depressed people are now recovering because of a variety of, so for example, they may not be taking drugs. They may be, their life is going better. They're getting, and I'll mention this in it shortly, but they're getting positive experiences. Those experiences actually raise serotonin levels. The serotonin, the raised serotonin levels increase neurotrophic factors. The brain 
has more neurons and more plasticity and can adapt. And this adaptability is allowing the person to get out of their depression. Then you cut out tryptophan from the diet, the brain becomes rigid again, they can't adapt, they go back to their old thinking and they go back to depression. This is a fascinating uh, study. Now, in depressed pe people, tryptophan in the blood is reduced in general. But this is not as clean cut as we would like to think because essentially, because there's also another theory of depression. So there's a serotonin theory of depression, there's a uh, neurogenesis related theory of depression that came about because of SSRIs, because people found out about the neurotrophic factors. There's also an inflammatory hypothesis of depression, which has many reasons for it. I won't get into here, but it's a very interesting theory. And uh, I very much uh, subscribe to it also. I subscribe to at least the neurogenesis and the inflammatory uh, theories. But basically, having an increase in inflammatory cytokines in the body actually decreases tryptophan levels in the serum also. So it's not clear that the, ser the decreased ser uh, uh, serum tryptophan levels are... Uh, consequent to the depression or consequent to the inflammatory cytokines that result of the depression or cause the depression, you know. So, uh, basically it could fit that cytokine hypothesis of depression. Now, one interesting thing, by the way, is that the, so SSRIs have uh, varied effectiveness, which I think we'll talk about later in another episode, but they have varied effectiveness in people that is not fully explained. About 10% of the variance in effectiveness is explained by variations in C-reactive protein. And for those who regularly watch the channel, you have heard this uh, a lot. C-reactive protein is a protein produced by the liver in response to an inflammatory, inflammatory cytokines being released in various parts of the body. So this indicates that there is some relationship between the change in inflammatory cytokines and the effectiveness of SSRIs. But really, I don't know if I should have mentioned this here, but anyway, it's quite interesting. There's a model of depression called, or, or sorry, a model of antidepressant drug action called the Cognitive Neuropsychological Model of Antidepressant Drug Action that postulates that emotional bias is what causes, what allows SSRIs or increased serotonin, not SSRIs, really, of increased serotonin transmission to affect depression. So it's not the, the serotonin itself, but rather that the serotonin, the increased transmission or serotonergic activity in general, affects how the amygdala responds to the environment, changing what's called serotonergic innervation to the amygdala. And the amygdala is the fight or flight center of the brain. So essentially what they're saying is that the emotional bias like having higher serotonergic activity in the in the in the brain allows someone to have less of a responsive amygdala. So, for example, amygdala responds more in people who take anabolic androgenic steroids. It also responds more in people that are impulsive, which also have lower serotonin activity. But in general, when the amygdala responds quickly, that means the person is used to being threatened. So, if this person is saying that. I mean, the person who created this theory is saying that the more serotonergic activity you have, the less that amygdala is responsive, and the more your emotional affect is less fight or flight responsive. There's also a theory called the Cognitive Neuropsychological Model of Antidepressant Drug Action. What this model postulates is that the reason serotonin, serotonergic activity affects um, depression is because serotonergic activity uh, influences serotonergic innervation to the amygdala. The amygdala is the fight or flight emotional center of the brain. And when the amygdala is overactive, people are essentially quicker to get in a fight or flight response, to get an anxious uh, state, and so on. So because serotonergic activity reduces essentially the, the uh, activity of the amygdala, this theory postulates that what ends up happening is that people have a generally a higher, better emotional bias, a positive bias. And over time, that positive bias allows them to reassociate their new experiences in their brain, which over time causes a change in depressive symptoms. Now, the interesting thing about this theory is that there is actually evidence that positive experiences increase serotonergic activity in the brain, and negative experiences decrease serotonergic activity in the brain. 
which means that there may be a positive feedback loop if this theory is correct, which means that serotonin increases the positive affect, which allows you to reassociate from experiences. But those experiences also increase the serotonin. So it goes, you know, because it's a drug theory. So it's both the drug and the experiences that raise the serotonergic activity and potentially in a positive feedback loop that may increase with time. Of course, not, not exponentially. It has diminishing marginal returns. So um, another thing I wanted to mention is that it's very interesting, and this doesn't support the rest of the theories here, which is that knockout mice that lack the uh, CERT gene, the serotonin transporter gene, do not fare much better than those that lack the NET gene the ones that appear to have the most, what they call in the literature, antidepressant phenotype are, which basically means the happiest acting mice, are the ones who lack the DAT gene, which is the dopamine transporter. Uh, although the DAT is not very pursued pharmacologically for affecting depression in people. And the change in DAT does not appear to increase dop um, neurotrophic factors in the brain, which is why I think it doesn't have this effect. But um, another thing I want to mention is that it's interesting. So when cortisol increases in the body, when it's, when it's uh, produced and synthesized, CERT synthesis, the synthesis of the serotonin transporter, also increases, which means more serotonin transporter is available in the brain to get serotonin out of that synaptic cleft between the two neurons. And that's exactly what the SSRI is blocking. So when cortisol, when the stress hormone comes out, people's CERT activity increases, which is what the SSRI is trying to block. So that's one way in which stress is causing a direct uh, sort of decrease in serotonergic activity, you could think of it like that. Now, interestingly, in people who are depressed and anxious, or anxious, both, both types, this doesn't really happen as much. And it's thought to be because their serotonin, their serotonin transporter CERT synthesis is already maximized. So they can't, it can't get much worse. Now, I also want to mention that a uh, couple of more things. First of all, depressed people have lower expression of the 5-HT2A uh, receptors in the brain. And more critically, I want to discuss uh, violent suicides. These people are called victims of suicide, although I don't feel that you can be a victim of yourself. But nonetheless, uh, people who die from suicide tend to have uh, a couple of things. Now, first of all, they tend to have uh, increased they tend to have more serotonergic neurons in the RAF nucleus than other people do. Remember, the serotonergic neurons in the RAF nucleus are the neurons that produce serotonin in the brain. They synthesize it originally. What does it mean that they have more there? That could mean couple of, a couple of things. Number one, that they never had excitotoxicity coming from having too much serotonin that could kill those neurons. Or number two, that the brain was trying to cope with lower serotonin levels by synthesizing more. So it had more of these neurons there. Basically indicating that these people probably had lower serotonin levels. Also, in depressed suicides, the people have higher 5-HT1A receptors. Remember, 5-HT1A are those receptors that are autoreceptors in the presynaptic neuron. Which means that when they're agonized by serotonin, serotonin synthesis decreases. So these people may again have had lower serotonin and they also have higher expression of the CERT transporter, serotonin transporter, indicating overall that depressed people, I mean, this is really strongly associated, have lower serotonin levels, which is why, although I won't discuss this in much detail actually in this video, and the reason why I won't discuss it neither here nor in the rest of the series is because high-dose lithium, Okay, just briefly, high-dose lithium, which is the most effective drug to prevent suicides in man, uh, definitely, no doubt, at like 800, uh, 700 to 1,200 uh, milligrams a day, is extremely effective. Um, it's usually given as a mood stabilizer or to prevent suicide in the short term. And this is something people should know in case you have family members that are uh, suicidal. So you go to a psychiatrist and ask them about high-dose, short-term lithium treatment. The reason why I don't discuss lithium also, I was going to say, that's why it works. Lithium also works through serotonin as well. It increases serotonergic activity, increases neurotrophic factors like SSRIs, but also has other effects like it, uh, it uh, affects the glucose synthase, synthase kinase and therefore may have longevity effects. The problem with high-dose lithium treatment is that it 
destroys the kidneys. So uh, almost anyone within 20 years, and there are people that have been on it for 20 years, will eventually uh, lose their kidney function, which is a problem because in general, for those of us planning or hoping to live long, kidney function in general go, decre diminishes with age and you, you only have two kidneys. So you don't really want to punish the kidneys too much. With that said, in the short term, it is the most effective treatment for, for uh, preventing suicides. Any good psychiatrist knows that. And if they have someone seriously suicidal, unless there's some serious contraindication, they'll move them to a high dose lithium treatment. Now, there are people, and I actually uh, had a conversation about this, uh, about the subject on Reddit. There are people who, there was a study a few years ago uh, in which uh, it was shown that the lithium content of drinking water in areas corresponded to uh, behavioral states in those areas. And the lithium content that people would be consuming was quite small. So it was thought maybe that the lithium, even in a small amount, lithium being necessary for some bodily functions, would be useful at improving mood a little bit. I don't really subscribe to this theory. So there are people going around consuming 5 milligrams or 10 milligrams of lithium orate. So this is a little off topic, but there are people who do that. I don't really think it's necessary. Uh, it's certainly not uh, probably that harmful. Lithium orate is actually more kidney toxic than other forms of lithium, but it is also better absorbed. Now, it's not clear whether it's more kidney toxic than it is better absorbed, but in either case, it probably won't harm you to consume a little bit amount of lithium, but it probably won't have very much of an effect compared to taking an SSRI. But it will have other effects as well. So anyway, thank you for listening. Uh, I hope you guys learned something from this, and I'll see you soon in another video about a subject I haven't decided on yet.